In fact, obviously Donald Trump to me, is, is, is obviously he's a, a Rust Belt president. I mean, he he's just he's captured those states uh, which uh, suffered. Oh, he acknowledged their he suffering. Acknowledged, yeah, he acknowledged their suffering. I, right. I hear you. you see, right. I hear you. And uh, in France, Macron, President Macron, has talked about the uprising of the left behinds. Mm -hmm. Was his phrase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's as though it's as though um, you know the. Inter I mean, the elite, so to speak, the, whatever you, you call the, the people who are in power, who should be accountable to their voters, um, simply ignored them. They were too complacent, they, they, yeah, and they were too contemptuous. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and, and so um, they're reaping the whirlwind, um, and I, I think it's very dangerous. I'm here today with Robert Skidelsky. Professor Emeritus at Warwick University, and he's written many, many books on the slump. He's written a trilogy on Keynes. It's a tremendous biography. And he has a new book called Money and Government, The Past and Future of Economics. Robert, thanks for joining us here today. Thank you for asking me. The uh, book that you've written is really broken into four parts. Why don't you describe the parts, and then we'll talk, as you describe, about what are the culprits and what took economics off course. Well, um, the first part is really about the history of money and the history of government, as, as seen by economists. And uh, the, uh, I think the main point about the history of money and why, why, why I wrote about it is there's been this persistent idea that you can separate money, the theory of money, from the theory of the real economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they called that the classical dichotomy. Money's a veil. Money is a veil that hides, hides people's um, yes. uh, uh, view of the reality of mm -hmm. things. And uh, I've, 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 that's been a thread that's run all the way through economics. It's been suppressed at times. It was challenged by Keynes. But then it came up again just before um, the last slump of yes. 2008. Yes. So that's the, the money bit. Then uh, parallel with that, I've done the eco economist's view of governments. As uh, you know, the, the, the old view was that the state could be quite creative in various ways, but that was replaced when scientific economics uh, came into existence with the view that the state was barren. It was barren fruit, that anything the state did was taking money away Mm -hmm. from producing out. Is yeah, what you the see, yes, that's it. right. They, they started to distinguish between productive and unproductive activities. Mm -hmm. um, and the state was definitely in the unproductive sector. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if, and, and what's more, the state was the main generator of the deceptions of money. Uh, because it was the state printing too much, creating too much money that deceived people mm. about the reality. So if you could keep the state small, that was also a way of keeping money neutral. Mm -hmm. If you could get the fingers of the state away from the printing press, and the gold standard was sort of the you know, main attempt to do that historically. Anyway, then I go on in the second part of the book. I really show how all this um, sort of view of the of money and the state broke down in the Great Depression, First World War and the Great Depression because that uh, simply um, uh, disturbed all the settled relationships and all the settled theories mm -hmm. that had um, um, you know, been existent before the First World War. And then Keynes comes along, and Keynes says, no, look, this classical dichotomy is all wrong. In right. fact, money is incredibly important. It has, he says, motives of its own. You can't just, you'll never be able to make it neutral. Mm -hmm. and, and, and therefore, the economy isn't stable because the money is always disturbing everything. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what you have to have is stabilization policy, um, and that has to be done by the government. So the second part of the book is about the rise and fall of the Keynesian revolution. Mm -hmm. And, and they did, it did fall in the 1970s yes. for various reasons we could talk about. The third part is the crisis of 2008, why it happened, and how they tried to deal with it. And, it happened partly because they'd abandoned Keynes and Keynesian policies of prevention were no longer considered necessary because they felt they'd got the neutrality of money at last. 
through central bank independence and inflation targets. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't supposed to happen, this crisis. In fact, inflation was well controlled, not necessarily because of what central banks did, so they thought there was no problem. And what's more, the extraordinary thing is, there were no banks in their models, yes. because money was simply an intermediary well, yeah. between savers and investors. You didn't, it was institutional naked, this, these models of central mm -hmm. banks. You mm -hmm. had the collapse, and then all the old theories started coming back. And finally, as Lenin said, what is to be done? <laughs> and is I that John Lennon or VI? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe both would have. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, but it was, it was VI Lenin who actually yes. said it. And so I give some ideas for how economics uh, can be changed in order for economic models to get closer into touch with the real world, how you need to put financial institutions into the center of the picture and therefore what to do about them mm -hmm. becomes very important. Mm -hmm. Also to explain why the slump gave rise to the most virulent form of politics we have had over much of Europe and America since the Second World War. Yes, yes. And how the great danger, uh, uh, um, uh, how, how great the danger is uh, unless we actually fix uh, thinking. You talk about the culprits, in essence, how we got off course. I know in that section of the book you bring out the questions related to ideas relative to vested interests, the power of vested interests, and the role it plays specifically related to financial deregulation. Why I'm zooming in on this is uh, one of our board members at INET and a sponsor of a great deal of research suggests that almost every financial crisis in history comes from excesses in private debt accumulation, not from excesses in government spending and wasteful government spending as you referred to previously in this conversation. How do you see the culprits? How does that unfold? In well, w the question one has to ask, um, I think, is why has there been this excessive debt accumulation? Uh, which, of course, is, is qu that's quite correct. I mean, all those ratios of debt to anything else just shot up mm -hmm. in the years before, before the, the slump, and, and, and they've started to shoot up again. I think the economic theory um, that brings you closest to an answer of that is underconsumption theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think when you get too much inequality, you lose mass consumption power, and therefore it's more difficult to keep the economy. It's yes. more difficult for people to maintain their customary levels of spending. Um, the job, jobs deteriorate, the quality of jobs mm -hmm. and the pay connected with them, and more money is heaped up in a small a minority of with people. With high propensity I mean, to save. And with one percent, with yeah. high propensity to save. Yeah. I mean, oh, that was that was recognised in the last depression. Actually, people people were say, were saying, look, underconsumption is a problem in explaining the Great Depression. That, um, uh, and, but then that that insight was lost. Mm -hmm. And and I mm -hmm. think it would be fair to say that economics gave up on problems of distribution. It having compressed inequality in the Keynesian era. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that was part, part of the reason for the success of it. Yes. They then said, well, you know, they then came to Reaganomics. And Reaganomics and all that stuff about Laffer curves. Yes. I don't know whether anyone remember. Yeah, they do. They George do remember the Laffer curve. H.W. Bush called it voodoo economics. Voodoo economics. Even Bush did. But Laffer curve was very influential. In other words, if you redistribute money from the poor to the rich, yeah. You get very beneficial effects on productivity, work effort, and all these kinds of things. Seems so like there's a recent tax cut in the United States that's uh, yeah, paying yeah. homage to that same idol. It, it, some people called it supply-side Keynesianism. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> though it's, I mean, I think you have to emphasize the supply-side bit. Um, I mean, it, 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 it didn't... It didn't it didn't think it was operating through demand to increasing demand in the economy, no. which is what a Keynesian uh, tax cut program mm -hmm. would be about, but it was in improving work effort. And it was and also improving what you might call the conditions for expansion of investment capacity, yeah. modernizing the capital stock, 
in the intensive margin, yeah. expanding the capital stock, and providing, therefore, more jobs. Yeah, but it was entirely uh, theoretical. Well, it didn't it, it have did, demand did, for it, the product. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, yeah. uh, achieve its results. Right. Um, because right. you know you can a lot of, you can give a lot of people uh, a lot more money, but you've got still you know it's an act of faith whether they'll actually spend them in in uh, uh, producing new productive machinery. Yeah. And of course, what happened in the in the states in the, in the period leading up to the to to the slump, there was a big buyback of of, of uh, 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 company buyback m mergers and acquisition activity. Mm -hmm. In other words, a big expansion of the financial operations yes. of the economy, but a growing disconnect between those operations and the uh, and the real economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that seems to me to be an important um, explanation of why the debt to GDP ratio kept rising. You weren't creating enough GDP yeah. uh, to sustain the amount of debt you were accumulating. Well, at some level, with a more equal distribution of income and people in the lower portion having a higher propensity to consume, demand would inspire investment and sustain that's, a, that's a faster route. growth that's rate the route. rather than yeah. supply yeah. creating what you might call productive capacity but nobody having enough money to yeah. buy the end product. In, in, in the first yeah. is, yeah. I think, the, the be, much the better route, mm -hmm. as well as sat, being much, much better satisfying elementary considerations of equity. In all of the major advanced economies, perhaps with the exception of Canada, uprisings now yeah. about, how would I say, that relate directly to the shock yeah. to the v large number of people who are being, how do you say, pushed down, whether by some uh, adjustment to globalization, automation, global supply chains, and or fears of migration. Yeah. And all of these types of shocks are scaring people and are geographically correlated, where the fear is high is where the uh, politics of the AFD, Marie Le Pen, Brexit, and Donald Trump yeah. up, arise. Well, you see, I, I mean, my, my little f formula for encapsulating what you've just been saying is bad economics produces bad politics. Yes. And um, I think we've had evidence of that. In fact, uh, obviously, Donald Trump, to me, is, is, is obviously he's a, a Rust Belt president. I mean, he, he's just, he's captured those states uh, which uh, suffered. Oh, he acknowledged their he suffering. Acknowledged, yeah, he acknowledged their suffering. I, right. I hear you. You That's see, right. I hear you. And uh, in France, Macron, President Macron, has talked about the uprising of the left behinds, mm -hmm. was his phrase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's as though, it's as though um, you know, the inter I mean, the elite, so to speak, the, whatever mm -hmm. you, you call the, the people in power, who should be accountable to their voters, um, simply ignored them. They were too complacent, they, they, yeah, and they were too contemptuous. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and, and so um, they're reaping the whirlwind. Um, and I, I think it's very dangerous um, because you don't know, you know where it's going to go. That's and what it seems. And people often thought embedding capitalism in democracy would maintain what you might call its moral balance through yeah, governance. Yeah. But when the wisdom of crowds becomes the madness of crowds and demagoguery takes hold, yeah. it's very hard to see a corrective course that uh, is, is satisfying and, and maintains and, a democratic yeah, spirit. No, I agree. And in my book, I pay, little, I pay some attention to the argument of Danny, Danny Roderick because mm -hmm. I think it's a good argument. You, 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 know, you have nation, uh, you have nation, democracy, and globalization. You can have yep. two of those, but you can't have three of them. Right. And right. I mean, if we're, if, we're in if, we're, if, we're, if we believe that governments should be accountable to their people, then they can't simultaneously be accountable to the bond markets, to the bankers, to, mm -hmm. you know, people understand that, um, and the, 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 the only unit of accountability in the world, actually, is the nation state. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the European Union is a very interesting example of, of actually trying to transcend it. In other words, being um, a, 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 a model almost of, of a globalized economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. um, within, a region. within 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 the region. Yes, and. And, and I think that was thought to be, uh, that was thought, it was thought that, that might transcend the Roderick uh, trilemma, that you mm -hmm. would actually get 
democracy in Europe and it would enable yeah. um, that area to function as an integrated market. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, it didn't do it. Um, it hasn't done it because the uh, democratic institutions were too feeble. They couldn't create the right governing structure to right. make something like the Eurozone work. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a state. Well, you had a it currency did. union, yeah, it but not fiscal transfers, not, fiscal, yeah. not a common banking exactly. uh, regulatory For framework and things of that nature. For those, you need something much more like a state. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and there wasn't the will to create a state. And then now, of course, there are efforts to say, OK, we've got to reform the, the European Union in order to get better governing structure, in order to get a finance minister, in order to get a budget, in order to get a, 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 a European monetary fund going, yes. uh, in order to have European-wide financial regulation. And time and again, you come up against the resistance of the individual members. Yes. Yes. So that's a huge question mark. Yes. Uh, over the, over the future of the European Union. Mm -hmm. The European Union is committed to the four freedoms, one of which is the free movement of labor. Country after country within the Union is repudiating it. Yes. Just recently, Austria, yes. I mean, yes. Hungary we know, Poland, Italy, and Merkel has fallen because she allowed in a million refugees. Mm -hmm. France, Le Pen, and the various... So what are they going to do about that? How, how are they going to make that freedom work? Yes. I don't yes. think they can. And if that freedom doesn't work, what about some of the other freedoms? Mm -hmm. Why can't a country put up tariffs um, against, say, permanent German um, uh, export surpluses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so... Uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it can't it's be a nation quite, and not a nation at yeah, the same time. It's quite fragile. <laughs> yes, yes. So you look at the economics profession. You've seen these, as you mentioned earlier, the false consciousness about monetary policy, the false consciousness about what we might call Ricardian equivalence and the ineffective of fiscal policy. You have seen, how would I say, these uh, pillars of misguided thought challenged by the crisis of 2008-10. We're now in 2018. What do you see as the role of the economics profession now at a time when politicians have demonized and discredited trust and legitimacy in experts? I think from the point of, for the point, from the point of view of educating the next generation of economists, um, if I could encapsulate it in one phrase, less technique, more history, and more and, 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 and more knowledge of other ad ad adjacent fields of study. Multidisciplinary. Yeah. Yeah. In yes, other words, the, yeah. it has to be rebalanced. I'm not against technique, but I think the case has to be made out for uh, a, the mathema mathematization of the subject, which has gone much further than it need. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's based on the idea that, <coughs> that reality, the only way you can express reality is in mathematical form. And if you can't do it in maths, you've just got confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, clear ideas are here, confusion is there. Confusion is sociology, confusion yeah. is psychology, too many, too many vague notions, um, you know, mm -hmm. dancing around, no, no proper basis but, but for choosing between them. Developed misspecified model of the economy. In other words, the map doesn't fit the terrain. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> and, and and there's a great there's a great confusion about actually there right at the heart of it in in in, in the notion of the model. Because when we think of a model, we think maybe of a, a model aeroplane. And a model aeroplane has is a slimmed down version of the real thing, and we yeah. can actually compare them directly. Right. And we know where it deviates. But you can't compare model directly to the real thing. All you can do is try to test some of its uh, axioms and suppositions against the real thing. But you get into such technical problems in doing that that, you, you know, they, they're very, very weak models uh, as, as empirical structures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have to rely on something much more like a, a deductive structure. So the maths proves the maths. Economics doesn't need um, ethics or history. It only needs arithmetic. So you don't care about your fellow. Does arithmetic give you humanity? Does arithmetic right. tell you to care about your fellow men? Only if you can represent it, uh, this uh, humanity, as uh, a form of repeated game. Mm -hmm. 
which mm -hmm. we play. And then we learn through repeated games, we learn cooperation. In other words, it's the only way that e economics, as I see it, can come to resemble the language that should be normal to all of us and is, which is norms, mm -hmm. conventions, effective relationships, community. I think home for me is wherever we are discussing the mismatch between these ideas and the challenges yeah, we face. Yeah. And so home isn't a geography. A it home, becomes a purpose. It's a purpose. And a community of people aligned around that purpose. Yeah, yeah. And, and also a community united by love and by what, you know, sociologists call affective ties. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. you know, you can trust them. You, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're like you. Yeah. All those things are... Are they they're put, not strangers. Yeah. Are they're, they putting their shoulder to the wheel and yeah. trying to help? And of course, <laughs> yeah. and, and absolutely, and that yeah. affects their attitude, people's attitude to the welfare state. And yeah. you know, are these are these people? You know, why are we why are we shoveling out money for people who are not mm -hmm. like us? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're a community. We're a political community. Of course, that's a broader concept. Immediately, yeah. we're a political community. Um, but should we? Should we? You know, and so it's so easy to get a rhetoric going of scroungers mm -hmm. and people who just come in to abuse the social services. Yeah. Parasites. Is Parasite. the, that's right. But it's fascinating because if your faith in your fellow what man or woman deteriorates to a point where you think you're on your own, you start to behave more selfishly. Yeah, exactly. And if everybody does you that, start, the whole system disintegrates. Too. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. as, as we know. Or, or threatening to. Or threatening to. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there's a huge amount increase in that kind of isolated violence, which yes. nevertheless expresses a, social, expresses a social fact of alienation and yes. isolation. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, how, how would I say, in this INET community, we're grateful that you're putting your shoulder to the wheel with all of your work throughout your career the way in which you engage in debate, whether in books or project syndicate or on stage. And uh, I just want to thank you for being here again today. It's been delightful to be here.